I spent, mm, I'd say about a month, uh, kind of getting a crash course and how to walk and talk like a skinhead. And then it was all in, in preparation for this event called the Rocky Mountain Heritage Fest, which was a, you know, neo-Nazi white nationalist pick your turn gathering that happened near Denver. and start that fake fire, it is time to camp remotely, albeit. Today, we are about to have an amazing conversation. And before I let you participate in that conversation, we do have to do a word to our sponsor. I am very proud to announce that we are now partnered with Can Do Foods and the makers of Keto Crisp. Okay, so you all know I don't really do a lot of ads because frankly, um, I don't like to be paid to talk about stuff. And you know what, this bar is so worth it. It is medium chain triglycerides. It is whey protein isolates. It is amazing taste. One of the best selling bars in America. Frankly, you need to go pick up one right now. Will it make you a better person? I can't say that. Both the FDA regulations and it's probably not true. But does it taste amazing? Absolutely. So go out and get a Keto Chris bar right now. What do you, in fact, turn on this podcast while you are running out the door to go get a Keto Chris bar. So Can Do, thank you for partnering with us. And without further ado, how about we get to something you did want to listen to? And that is my next guest, David Holthouse. Now, he is a gonzo journalist. Now, do you know what gonzo is? It has nothing to do with the Muppets, okay? Gonzo journalism, we're gonna break this down. This guy's an award-winning documentary filmmaker, a writer, also thrown into some pretty sketchy situations and emerged victorious. So I, he's been on, featured on the Joe Rogan podcast and of course this podcast, which I'm sure he will say later on, eclipses that in every way. So without further ado, please welcome to the podcast, David Holthouse. Hey, thanks for having me on, man. Hey, thanks for being here, man. Sorry you had to sit through the requisite, you know, uh, partner placement. But uh, hey, you know, have you Keto Chris is actually really good. I will just, I will give them another plug. It's next time you're off, you know, looking for Sasquatch and you get hungry and you need something. That's your that's your bar. What's you know? the go-to flavor? Ooh, okay. Yeah, I'll help uh, you with the plug here. What's the go-to flavor? Okay, I love chocolate mints and the almond butter. But many people love they have one just called butter and salt. So if you weren't sold already you have butter and salt. So, Keto Chris. So, should you find yourself in Mendocino County, up somewhere north in California in the Emerald Triangle, lost without any hope, you too can turn to a delicious tasting bar as your final snack. So. <laughs> well done. Oh man, thank you. Yeah, go get some. Um, all right, man, I have so much I want to talk to you about. Uh, first off, I know it's it's been a little bit since, how long, how long ago did Sasquatch come out? Sasquatch came out on 420 of last year, so 420, 2021. Okay, it's been a year, so it's been a year, a little over a year. year uh, that, yeah. yeah, that was, I mean, that is a remarkable, it's funny, I still think some people wrestle with uh, that it's not about Sasquatch. Like, I, I remember when I first heard about it and our mutual friend told about it, I was like, oh wait, this guy made a documentary about Sasquatch, and you were saying actually in the reviews that some people were actually yeah, man, like upset, looking, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's funny. It's like you look at Rotten Tomatoes, and the critic score for that show is like in the in the mid to high 90s, like solid fresh, right? And then the audience score though is in the mid to low 50s. But if you look at the reviews, the the most of the negative reviews are like, "This is bullshit. This show isn't about Bigfoot at all." Either that or they take issue with the fact that at the end of the show, I declaratively state that I do not, in fact, believe in, in Bigfoot. <laughs> I think the line is like, hell no, I don't believe in Bigfoot, but I believe in greed, right? Yeah. Um, and they just, uh, yeah, just got slammed by the Squatchers. Squatchers hated that show. They felt like it was a bait and switch, right? That, that, that finally, like, Sasquatch was going to get his due in three episodes of documentary TV on Hulu. And yeah. in fact, it, it turned out to be a, a, a dope, true, you know, a dope story. Uh, a true crime story, a murder mystery, nothing oh, yeah. to do with the cryptid. It's dope both as a descriptor and as a subject matter. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean yeah, it's yeah. been widely, I mean, it is, it is intense. And I think, so it's been a year now, a little over a year. I mean, it's, you know, that's, that's something that I think people may need to revisit because it's, it's a, it's a fascinating story. And I think a lot of people aren't familiar with what goes on up there because you mentioned in, in a previous interview that the image for a lot of people of Northern California uh, and, you know, the sort of, you know, uh, marijuana growing culture is like a bunch of utopian hippies and everyone just hanging out. And if you watch this documentary, uh, you will see that that is not the case. 
Yeah, no, it's a pretty cutthroat business up there and has been for a while. I think it's even gotten more violent since weed was legalized um, because the price has kind of fallen out. You know, the prices, the bottom fell out of the, of, of the market. So a lot of these smaller time growers, unless they were able to make some sort of transition to like boutique weed, you know, sun-grown, organic, outdoor weed, they, they, they've they really struggled. And so when the pie gets that much smaller, um, people get more violent. What is now, I know, so obviously we have disavowed uh, the Sasquatch. So sorry, listeners, if you were... You know, you can take issue with David's stance on Sasquatch. Uh, we are obviously a nonpartisan show, so we will not take a stance on Bigfoot. I have personally not seen a Bigfoot, but that's not to say those woods can't be scary, right? <laughs> I mean, it's uh, that's big country. I'm from Alaska originally. You know, when we say Alaska in Alaska, we have this saying that it's big country, meaning it's like it's a wild place where it's like it's really easy to disappear, or where if you just make one mistake too many in a series of unfortunate events, it's easy to get yourself dead. And those woods are, are, are big country in that sense. I mean, it's, um, I will say that when I was in up there, like Sasquatch made a lot more sense, right? Like in those, that, there's even a, just the trees are so big, the ferns are so big, it seems like a primordial place, right? It seems like a place where it wouldn't be surprising to see a brontosaurus walking around. <laughs> little, that stuff. But it's also really remote. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's, you get off one of those state, two lane state highways and get on the back roads that sort of spider web through the mountains up there. And you can get, <laughs> you can get lost in a hurry in every sense, right? Oh, man. I mean, there's, there's a lot, a lot of bodies up there in those woods. Man, so I'm curious when you were, if you looking back now, do you think was there any trace that you knew you would be a journalist? And in particular, I do want to dive into this sort of this type of journalism where you've kind of put yourself at risk and you're you know doing this this exposure stuff. I uh, uh, did you is this something you would ever have thought you would have gotten into? Yeah, I mean, I decided really early on that I wanted to write and tell stories for a living. By early on, I mean, I think it was like 10th grade honors English. So, you know, 15, 15 years old. <laughs> and, um, and then I saw an Oliver Stone, Stone movie called Salvador. And it's funny, like a lot of journalists, especially like, you know, the Washington Post or New York Times, mainstream media, I guess you could say. It's like a lot of their, their origin story, a lot of times is they saw all the president's men, about Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, and it made them want to be a journalist. Well, that wasn't what it was for me. For me, it was this Oliver Stone movie called Salvador, and James Woods plays this gonzo journalist, you know, who's basically just kind of flying by the seat of his pants and faking press credentials and, and get, you know, sort of mind, mind tricks, mind fucks his buddy into driving him down from uh, L.A. all the way through Mexico and into, into, into El Salvador to cover the, the civil war going on. And um, I saw that and I was like, that's it. That's what I want to do, you know. <laughs> So that's it, it. Took hold pretty early on, and then I then I went. I was in college at the University of California, Santa Cruz. One night I dropped acid and read and spent the latter, the like second half of the of the acid trip reading *Fear and Loathing* in Las Vegas, and that was revelatory. And then I immediately started checking out the rest of Hunter S. Thompson's work, starting with *Hell's Angels* and then *Fear and Loathing* on the campaign trail '72. And I was like, okay, now I really kind of have a guide star for the kind of journalism I want to practice. And so, you know, set about trying to become the second incarnation of Hunter S. Thompson. And I don't know. I like to say that I don't know how close I came, but if you look at my work in the '90s, I think that you can make an argument that no one else came closer. So, so what is the actual technical definition of gonzo journalism? Because I'll admit, I was completely unaware of this term. And then I look, actually, it was in meeting you and they said, oh, David Holthouse is a gonzo journalist. And there's no Muppet affiliation here. So <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, what is the textbook definition of this? I don't know that there is a textbook definition. I mean, some of the characteristics of gonzo journalism are, first of all, that objectivity goes out the window. Um, meaning like you not only acknowledge that every storyteller has a bias and that, that, that bring that bias, those biases to any story that they tell, but it's also you, um, you don't keep yourself out of the story. And as a matter of fact, you, you write yourself into the story as a character, like you're a character in the story that you're telling in Gonzo journalism. And, um, if you're an, if you're an observer, you're a participant observer, meaning you embed in the situation. That's another characteristic of Gonzo. Like the early, I could I could say that you could make an argument. The very earliest Gonzo journalism was a book that George was actually George Orwell's first book, and it was called Down and Out in London and Paris. And basically, he was addressing so, you know economic disparities in these two major European cities at the time. Uh, and I think this is the early 1900s. But he did so by going and living with like 
you know, people that were really on the margins in London and in Paris that were staying in flop houses that were just hustling for survival money, you know, and he went and lived with them sort of as one of them and wrote about it from that perspective. That's mm. a good example of gonzo journalism. So, you know, gonzo journalism is you write about crystal meth by staying up for 72 hours straight with, you know, crystal meth heads, or you write about gutter punks, homeless youths by living with them for four to six months. So it's about it's about the reporting style and it's also about the writing style. And the writing style is much more sort of like literary focused. It's mm. not the dry sort of one to two syllable prose of mainstream daily reporting. It's like you kind of let your freak flag fly a bit when you're writing Gonzo. Well, I don't know what 10th grade honors English class you were to be able to pull out an obscure George Orwell uh, reference. I was only forced to read Animal Farm. Actually, I shouldn't say forced. George Orwell's amazing. If you read 1984, I mean, that guy was prescient. He understood so much. And I, I, to this day, get chills when I think that all animals are created equal, but some are created more equal than others. And I went, thanks. Yeah, Crazy. you know, I read 1984 in 1984, dating myself there. And I no don't way. <laughs> I'm sort of terrified to go back and read it because, <laughs> yeah, I think it'll resonate a little too... Uh, two plus two is four, yeah. and two plus two is five. Right. Double right. think. Oh man, it's 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 crazy. Uh, but uh, all right, so I'm curious. You have put yourself in some really dicey situations, and for those who have not seen Sasquatch, uh, and actually, I'll David, I'll let you give the logline. But this this is a this is a pretty arresting and visceral documentary, and essentially, it's uh, it's an expose, right, of the kind of of the the world up there, right, of this 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 marijuana growing, you know, crime ridden world up there, right. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it was it, Sasquatch is essentially that in the early in 1993, there was this rumor circulating in northern Mendocino County among the dope growers community that three Mexican laborers working on a backwoods dope farm had been murdered and they'd been found torn apart and that a Sasquatch had done it. That Sasquatch footprints were found at the scene, that Sasquatch hair was found at the scene and that it couldn't have been a ripoff because ripoffs at that time were rampant because all the weed that was about to be harvested was just strewn around and that there were you know credible eyewitnesses <laughs> as credible as anybody in that game can be who yeah. had seen these bodies and so the show is is essentially trying to find what the origin of that story was and determine whether or not three people were in fact murdered and if so why anyone would have gone to the links to stage a triple murder scene to make it seem as if a Bigfoot had killed three guys. Yeah. That's what that's what that yeah that's what that story. And it, so it took me to a lot of these like back roads locations in northern Mendocino County, in particular this one area called Spy Rock, which is just a notorious place. And by notorious I mean that like you talk to cops up there like you just don't go to Spy Rock. If you do go to Spy Rock as a cop, you go in force, like you know, like with a tactical team. Like cops just don't go up there by themselves, you know, and outsiders are really not welcome. So um, I had to finagle invitations, shall we say, or have guides that would sort of take me up there and um, very carefully ask questions about not only an unsolved but an unreported uh, triple murder from you know more than a quarter century ago. So one of the first things that I wanted to ask you about all this is you, you're in some dicey situations. Are you terrified when you do this? I mean, I, I just think like, cause this takes a while to do this. It's not an overnight thing, you know? So you're, you're living in this probably state of stress, but like, how do you, how do you handle the knowledge of the sort of imminent danger that you're in by, cause this could, it could get hairy either way, right? You could, I mean, you could get, you know, so I mean, I know you're honest about what you're filming, but I mean, you don't know who you're going to run into up there. Yeah, that's right. And, and you know, I, and I'll answer your question in a second, but I'll just say that one of the things I figured out is that you, you start going around asking questions about unsolved murders from the 90s in the Emerald Triangle. You very quickly start getting information about unsolved murders that aren't necessarily the ones that you started out looking into. And you start coming in information that you're like, really not comfortable that I know this, right? <laughs> like, I don't want to find, I don't want the murderer uh, because there's no statute of limitations on murder, right? I don't want the murderer or murderers to know that I have sort of stumbled across this evidence that they had some people killed or killed some people a quarter century ago and got away with it. So um, 
But to answer your question, you know, and this gets to a real formative experience I had, and I'm very sort of open and upfront with this. I wasn't until I was about 32. But um, when I was seven years old, I was sexually assaulted. And the, the line between that and the kind of, I can draw now a direct line between that childhood trauma and the type of journalism that I went into. And to answer your question about being in sketchy situations, you know, it's a very common experience for people who are um, subjected to that kind of violence, either sexual violence or if they're in a, a really uh, traumatic, violent situation like any of these mass shootings that are plaguing our country right now, to disassociate, to basically like your brain is just like, this is too much for your body to handle. Then we're just going to kind of like kind of take a sh little break from reality. And so while I can remember the rape, it's disassociated. And while and I, you know, I've been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'll tell you that some of the symptoms of PTSD are no fun at all. But being able, I have kind of learned um, and am able to disassociate just a little bit in sketchy situations, especially situations where I'm working, where I was working undercover, which I don't really do anymore. But I did a lot of, you know, from about 2002 to 2010. And especially working undercover, it was useful to just be able to just separate myself from the reality of the danger just a little bit so that it just so that i didn't feel it if that makes any sense i didn't feel it like a quote unquote normal person would <laughs> all right um and for that reason i didn't come off as scared or sketched out to the people that were frankly pretty scary and sketchy hmm. Yeah. And I mean, it's, and there's, you talked, you, you shared with Joe this moment where everyone is talking about, I think, uncovering a body and everyone's laughing about it. And you have yeah. to kind of present this face of like, oh yeah, haha, ha, that's inside you're going, this is, why yeah. is every like, this is, no one should be laughing about this. This is crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That was up on Spy Rock. Yeah. I, that's, that's a, that was a kind of a sphincter puckering moment, man. Because, <laughs> you know, it was, um, I was trying to I was trying to find this guy named Bigfoot Gary, and I'd gotten as close as his neighbors, and uh, they'd invited me up to their place, and they knew him, and I was I was hoping that they would eventually introduce me to him, so I was just kind of hanging out with them. They were dope growers, meth heads, dope growers. One of them was a one of them was shooting heroin, the other one smoking meth, but uh, <laughs> you know I think they were poly drug enthusiasts, let's put it that way, and. Um, <laughs> They were. I got them talking about about murders, and and one of them was talking about all the different bodies that were, you know, in the woods or on their property even. And she started talking about how these uh, uh, these African American guys, though she didn't use that term, had come up from L.A. You know, recently within the last couple of years, and how they'd never left that mountain, and um, and that how you know how one guy uh when he realized that he was about to be executed it was a ripoff and that he was about to lose his life that he he urinated on himself and that um a day or two after they buried these bodies on her property her pit bull had come running back into running back to the to the main cabin with this guy's piss soaked boot and how funny that was and everyone's just laughing uproariously as she's telling the story and i was horrified but i had to be in character enough even though they knew i was a journalist they knew i was a documentary filmmaker and a journalist and they knew that i was there to try and get information and get access to other sources at the same time i was presenting to them as if somebody as if i was someone kind of from their world and so i had to i had to laugh i mean i had to agree that yes this is a, this is a hilarious thing that happened when your pit bull came running up with this dead man's piss so a dead man who by her account was buried you know within 100 150 yards where i was standing along with his two compatriots right so uh yeah that was um that was memorable to say the least <laughs> oh man how long did it take you to make sasquatch i'd say all in let me think about that i would say about a year yeah about a year from uh maybe a little bit more than a year from the time that um, you know that that I that I made my first fo investigative foray into Northern uh, California, from that point until when it was out on uh, uh, Hulu was about a year. Did you did you have it approved, and was this in partnership with uh, one of the streamers before with Hulu before you did, or did you go film it and then sell it? No, no, we uh, we Hulu Hulu bought the show. The director, a good buddy and collaborator of mine named Josh Rofay. Um, he, 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 and his partner, Steven Berger had sold the show to Hulu. Yeah. 
I mean, I was, I was a part of it, but they, you know, um, they, they, they took it out to market. They took this idea out to market and developed it. And, um, you know, Hulu made the best offer. So that's how that went down. That's right. I'm curious. Like, yeah, as I was going to say, if you were in partnership with Hulu, you know, is there key man insurance you have to take? What kind of insurance policy do you take out before you go, you know, immerse yourself in the uh, Emerald Triangle? <laughs> they, they, you know? they, people that I work with often make jokes about do they need to take out some sort of like, you know, extra supplemental life insurance or completion bond on the project that gets paid off by somehow just vanish off the face of the earth. But, <laughs> you know, they, I mean, I will say like in comparison with others, with other these major streaming companies that I work with, Hulu was pretty pretty tolerant of risk, meaning um, they were they wanted to be kept informed, uh, fully informed about how the investigation was proceeding and what moves I was sort of making, but they were, you know, they were willing to, as long as they felt like the risks had been carefully calculated, they were willing to let us take them. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's, uh, man, well, par- props to them for having the courage to do that and then for you to say yes to go in there. Now, the remarkable thing is this is not the only time you have embedded yourself uh, in a sort of contrarian <laughs> area. You also have embedded yourself with n- to investigate neo-Nazis. Which yeah, neo-Nazis, up- Klansmen, you know, white supremacists of all stripes, border militias. So I gotta be honest. I hear neo-Nazi, and I think like honestly, Blues Brothers comes to mind. Like it's a joke of like the gathering of like thirty guys, you know, and then John Belushi going, "I hate Illinois Nazis," you know. And so it's always been like a joke, but this is this. Is, and then I've seen American History X, but because I'm like, so have I just been woefully unaware? Is this like a a really big deal in America? Like, are there tons of neo-Nazis? I mean, I just I'm so astounded at this. Yeah, I mean, look, there's there is always a clownish aspect to neo Nazis or to the KKK, especially in the 2000s, right? Like, I like for instance, I never went to a Klan cross burning that didn't go awry. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were constantly <laughs> shooting one another on accident, setting themselves on fire. I mean, you get these fucking yahoos together with big flowing robes <laughs> and gasoline and big heavy pieces of wood. What could go wrong, right? <laughs> lots of moonshine. Yeah, somebody's going to the hospital before the night's over, but. And there are these neo-Nazi organizations, like it used to be called the National Socialist Movement. I mean, they had a but that are that are sort of cartoony in that way, in that they wear the brown shirt uniforms and the Swazi armbands, and they heil Hitler and shit. They're not the ones that I'm most worried about. Okay, they're the like sort of forward-facing neo-Nazi Hitler worshipping. But neo-Nazis, there's also the more dangerous ones are those that you know think that Hitler's business was unfinished or that he had the right idea, but they're a lot smarter in how they go about things. Meaning they're not out there like marching around in African American neighborhoods, wearing their stuff, trying to provoke a riot or, or having these like sort of ridiculous rallies where they're on one side of a huge, you know, group of cops yelling at the counter demonstrators. They're like getting elected to office, you know, or, or in in any office they can or school board, county commissioners, zoning, you know, county sheriffs in some places. I mean, there are organizations that are essentially semi underground, but what's interesting is that they're more, they're more, they sense that their moment is now, meaning like this particular period in American history, that this is the best shot they're going to get to gain control of the levers of power in the United States. Why do you think that is? Well, Trump, (laughs) frankly, (laughs) yeah, Trump, I mean, He's their boy, for sure. I mean, I'm not saying Trump's a neo-Nazi. I'm saying that they saw his his ascension to the presidency as a huge opportunity. And that's what that riot, you know, in Charlottesville in 2016 was uh, was about, you know, was they was them starting to make a move, meaning like the, the, that Unite to Right rally. That was like that was a call to arms, a white supremacist of all stripes to rally around this one cause. And they were, it's the most um, sort of public mass action that they've taken in a long time. The other one would be January 6th. I mean, if you look at photos of January 6th, what was going on around the Capitol then, I can, you can point to a lot of white supremacists and neo-Nazi symbols, you know, and there's a lot of cross-pollination between what we could call neo-Nazi groups. And neo-Nazi meaning, I guess I would just draw a distinction between the neo-Nazi groups that are like costume wearing Hitler worshipers but there's also neo-Nazi groups that they don't necessarily get down with that, but they believe in the tenets of Hitler's brand of, of national socialism, right? Which basically like the U.S. should 
be a country only by and for white, uh, straight uh, Christians. You know, no Jews allowed, no, no, no LGBTQ allowed, uh, and nobody that's, that's not white allowed, period, full stop. You know, every, they all need to get eliminated from the country. So another term that's sort of coming to vogue for that is white nationalism. But white nationalism is essentially neo-Nazism. So. Yeah, this is, and so you've, how have, what's been the work that you've done? You know, you, when we were talking earlier, you, you mentioned so embedding there, but what's, what's kind of the project or work that's led you to interface with these people? Well, I, yeah, it was in 2002, I was working for, um, I mean, I was always freelancing for national magazines, but my sort of like bread and butter day job was working for uh, what at the time was called an alt weekly. It's like a you know, kind of left leaning weekly newspaper that um, produced long form journalism, meaning like stories more than a thousand words in length. That'd be a, that'd be a huge story for a daily paper, you know, 2000 words, even 3000 words long, long form literary journalism, thoroughly researched, thoroughly written. And there's not many of them left. There's not many alt weeklies left. But I was working for one in Denver called uh, Westward. And uh, the Anti-Defamation League had a field investigator that had this idea that somehow she'd sold her bosses at the ADL on to train a journalist to go undercover as a neo-Nazi skinhead to cover a neo-Nazi event. And that would be a good way to try and get to shine a light of publicity on what the ADL saw at that time was a uh, sort of a rising rising problem like skinheads in the u.s were a major problem in the 80s and they kind of took a kind of took a nosedive most of the 90s but they were coming back in a big way in the early 2000s and so she uh this uh adl field investigator called up the editor of the of the westward and was like do you have anybody on your staff that would be interested in being trained to go undercover as a neo-nazi and my editor was like yes i have just the guy and so put me in touch <laughs> and um i spent I'd say about a month, uh, kind of getting a crash course and how to walk and talk like a skinhead. My hair at the time was much longer than it is now. So I had to cut my hair off completely, shave oh it all the way down to a one buzz cut. And, um, you know, started dressing out as a skinhead and getting a feel for what it was like to just move around in public dressed as dressed out as a skinhead. And then it was all in, in preparation for this event called the Rocky Mountain Heritage Fest, which was a, you know, neo-Nazi white nationalist pick your term gathering that happened near Denver. And I went into it thinking that this was just gonna be a sort of a one-off, a one-time thing. I would do this story and then, you know, be done with it. And um, I was, was I stunned maybe at this event because there were, um, I just got a sense that the neo-Nazi movement was much better funded, much better organized, and much more pervasive than I'd thought. I kind of had that same sort of like, and the best, the thing about that line from Blues Brothers is that it's not just Nazis, it's Illinois Nazis. Il right? I know, he's like Nazis. Nazis. Yeah. <laughs> Illinois Nazis. Illinois Nazis. I hate Illinois Nazis. Um, that, that was, you know, that they were that they were clowns, that they were like misguided and, and racist assholes, but they were generally clowns. And, and by that, I mean, mostly harmless. But what I saw at this meeting um, was levels of organization and, and um, networking that made it clear that this is a much more uh, much, much more expansive sort of underground web than um, than I than I had thought. And so I started you know, looking into it. And by that, I mean, like, figuring out how many organizations are there? How many, like, skinhead sets are there? Like, where are they concentrated? And really reading up on them and their history and just got, I guess, kind of got a dark fascination with it. And so I started um, going undercover to, you know, like, the, I worked for, um, the Westward was part of a chain of newspapers. It was called Village Voice Media. And they had papers all over the country. And so I would go to other, I would find out where there was going to be a neo-Nazi like hate rock fest or, or a, a clan gathering or whatever. And I would go to that city and go undercover and report on that for, um, you know, that city's alt weekly, whether it's Phoenix or Dallas or, or whatever. And so I, I kind of developed it as a specialty. It wasn't, it wasn't the only kind of journalism, gonzo stuff that I was doing at the time, but that was, mo that was about probably about half of it or so. And then in, uh, 2005, I was recruited by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which is a civil rights law firm based in Montgomery, Alabama, that they've done really good and do really good investigative work on uh, uh, you know racist extremists. 
And they basically told me like, if you keep doing this on your own, you're gonna get yourself killed, you know, but why don't you come work for us and we'll train you how to do it the right way. And so I was a investigative journalist that worked for them, you know, then for about five years. <sighs> okay, I have so many questions. First off, so you actually had to walk down like civilized civilization, like dressed as a skinhead and without the chance, if you happen to run it, did you ever run into someone you know when you were undercover? Uh, or is this no. so far removed? Because I, I, no, no, I did, I did. I was living in Denver, and I knew Denver well enough at the time to know, like, yeah, I'm not going to go into certain neighborhoods dressed like a skinhead. But what I found is one of the places I, I went to. That, I remember I went to the Cherry Creek Mall, which is like an upscale shopping, you know, galleria kind of thing. In Denver. Oh my God, dressed as a skinhead. In it, and oh. I, I, this is one of those things where I'm like, I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. I kind of liked it because people were just intimidated by me. You know, it was just because I was, you know, I'm a fairly big guy, but just the fact that I was wearing a flight jacket and Doc Martens and it was obviously a skinhead, you know. Um, Are there open brandishings of like, like swastikas and stuff? Or is it more just like you look like a, same yeah. with like a, you could identify a biker dude, even if you didn't know he was Hell's Angel, just like, oh, right. I know that yeah, guy. Yeah, big like that. yeah. Okay. but I looked like a not, I looked like a Nazi skin and I had like the, you know, I had certain like, there's there's different colors of suspenders and laces in your boots and stuff. And I had all that. So there's all so. code, there's code, there's all sorts of hidden symbols and codes oh, that yeah. the average yeah. person's not, a, yeah. and they, and that's designed that others would recognize you yeah. and like give you. 100%. Oh yeah. my! And so, so I'm curious too. So this is about uh, is this 10, 15 years ago? You said, or is this? This is yeah, about more closer to yeah, close, closer to twenty than fifteen. So this is okay. two thousand two to well, two thousand two to two thousand ten. Because there's something too. I I don't know if you agree with this, but it feels like in the zeitgeist right now that you know you could twenty years ago if someone wore on either side of a political spectrum a really outlandish and you know offensive you know, symbol that people might be tempted to ignore them. Whereas mm -hmm. today it seems like there's a higher likelihood of a direct confrontation, uh, whether it's a comedian getting hit, you know, or uh, accosted on stage or more protests. I mean, you, you've been around this longer than I have. Do you feel, is that a, do you think that's accurate or do you feel that uh, it was just as, like if you were to do that walk down the mall today, uh, assuming people still go to a mall, right? Versus, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah, you'd be, you'd be confronted. Yeah. 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 I, would, oh, man. I would never do that today. And there's no, also, there's no videos then, right? There's no, um, cell phones oh, aren't around taking yeah. video of, hey, just saw David Holthouse dress, yeah. you know, right. dress as skinhead at the mall. Yeah. And there's only very few places where skinheads still will sort of dress out and do that. You know, there's a few cities in the country where they still have a presence. But for the most part, they sort of morphed into, you know, Proud Boys or some other or similar organization, right? They, they've, well, yeah. Was there a comp and when you embedded yourself this, were there, um, this is a weird question. Were there people you met that aside from the sheer uh, lunacy of these ideas and just the, 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 the hatred and vitriol that you actually, you're like, if you, this is worth it. If you weren't a racist Nazi, mm -hmm. I feel like you're someone, or like, I understand your story. Uh, did you develop any like empathy for some, did some of them seem to be like hurting and you, and this, then this ideology was like, a had filled a vacuum in their life. Yeah, there's like plenty of like lost boys in that movement. Yeah, that you definitely developed. I, I didn't meet anybody that I felt like, you know, uh, absent the ideology, you and I would become really good friends, but I definitely met some people that I was like, I think you're actually essentially a good person. You've just taken a really wrong turn here. Mm. You know, like this, like there's some, like the like the ideal, ideology of Vikings and the sort of Odinist um, mythology is rampant in the neo-Nazi world because Hitler was really into that stuff. And so I often felt like there's these guys that just took a really wrong turn at the Renaissance fair, somehow, <laughs> you know, in, in the neo-Nazi group, you know, they thought it was cool to like drink meat from a drinking horn and dress up like a Viking. And somehow they like, Really? I love that for you. When you run out of edgy topics, like fast forward to David Holdhouse 20 years from now, and he's like undercover at a Renaissance fair, <laughs> exposing the gothic reenactors, you know, or the, the Scott, the more, what do you call it? The, the Saxons, Anglo-Saxons. David reveals all that comes in. 
Um, were there was there an underlying thread that you found that connected a lot of people who had who had uh, given into neo Nazis? Were they people from impoverished backgrounds? Were they because it sounds like you met some given the organization? It sounds like mm-hmm. far from being cartoonish clowns that there actually were some educated like, you know, connected, you know, individuals. So I'm curious, it was not all people that had come from an impoverished background or, or parental woundings or something. It was all, no. all, all this across the whole spectrum. Yeah. I mean, there was strata. And, but what I found is that, um, the people that were leaders of these groups, I often got the sense that they might not necessarily even believe the ideology that they were in it for the power, just to, just to, just to have like, you know, a cadre of people that they could command and get to do their will. Yeah. Um, but that's what drew that. That's what really drew them to it. Um, and they were generally, you know, college educated, not grad school educated, and came from money. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So, and, and so you said, and so the, you know, cause obviously on the other side of the political aisle is the, you know, theory that there's folks like George Soros or, you know, there's other wealthy uh, liberals who are coordinating, you know, groups. Did you feel that on this side, there's also um, that there's sort of a, did you like walk away going, there's some master plan, like some uh, Davos equivalent or like world economic for like yeah, planning no, no, of this. No, 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 you're no, I never got that sense. I would say that, that there were, there's some really interesting links between the government of Russia and like white power movement in the U S and in Europe and in England. Um, okay. You say that I had an Uber driver one time who, who told me, he's like, can I tell you something? And you have to promise not to rate me uh, low stars. And I'm like, I don't know what you're going to say, but okay. Uh, and he's like, I'm alt right. And I'm like, wow. Okay. Like we, it's 30 minutes in the car. I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm like, I'm waiting for Ashton Kutcher to come out of the car and like, you know, punked or something. But he was adamant that Putin was a maligned, uh, uh, a hero that was being maligned. And he was, and I thought, I mean, it was just one of those things we kind of like, you know what? We got a 40 minute ride to LAX. I'm just going to listen to what you have to say. This yeah. is crazy. And it was, but it was so pro Russia. And so it's interesting you say that because he was all about Putin and how Putin was actually like a force for good in the world. Yeah. So there's like skinhead gangs in Russia that are not only tolerated, but you could say that they, that they, it, it's, it's fair to say that they act as an arm of the state, meaning that they are, they are kind of like, street thugs who are very pro you know putin regime as well as being um you know pro racial purity as they see it and uh there's even a motorcycle gang he's known my name i'm blanking on it's like a white power motorcycle gang in, in russia where the like ties to the government are even more direct and i mean it's not just it's not just a matter of sort of cops looking the other way what they're doing in moscow but it's like there's actually like they're, they're, they're affiliated with pro Putin political parties in the same way that like soccer thugs are affiliated with a certain, you know, soccer team or football team, if you will. Right. And so there's that part of it. And, they, and I would run into them uh, being like Russian skinheads um, that always seem to have a lot of dough in their pocket, more dough in their pocket than your typical skinhead did at, at these gatherings in the U S. And so I thought there was always something there. And then it's also, it is really safe to say that alt-right or, or skinheads, neo-Nazis, white nationalists, again, pick your term, really do have a hero worship for Putin. I mean, he's like even more than Trump, frankly, he's like, he's their boy. Um, man, even, this, yeah, this that's crazy, man. It's, uh, I, I, I just, man, I cannot imagine walking into a, um, a place of commerce dressed as this. I just, it's even undercover. Like you'd be like, no, no, I'm just the, the sheer fear of running into someone. Even if you're under, you're like, no, 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 I promise I'm undercover. You know, it just, that's, that's insane. I've had moments like that too. I've had, <laughs> I've had, yeah. So one brief war story, um, after the Charlottesville thing, 2016, I sort of like came out of retirement briefly and, uh, went to work in undercover assignment at a different, and you know, I think Chattanooga, Tennessee, that was like, it was gonna be one of the same things. It was like some people wanted to take down a monument to a Confederate Civil War general, and it was because it was look, shaping up to be a flashpoint. And so I went in, but I still, I had long hair. I kind of went in as more of like, a, you know, like an ultra right YouTube podcaster kind of thing. Um, 
and was on the side of the, and there were Klansmen and neo-Nazis and neo-Confederates and skinheads and all that separated by the cops and sort of screamed at one another. But I, I came about as close as I have to getting seriously injured because after the rally was over, I was trying to make my way back to my hotel in the, in the, in the downtown. And these guys that turned out to be like University of Tennessee football players who had been counter protesters saw me and was like, there's the long haired Nazi and started chasing <laughs> me, you know? And I was like, and I just, I basically like found this cop and was seeking protection from this cop. But the cop had no love for Nazis either. It was basically, but she gave, she bought me enough time to pull out my driver's license and pull up like an article that was about me. And so then when she was like, you know, get lost and kind of threw me to the wolves, frankly, I was just like, gentlemen, gentlemen, just give me like one minute of your time. You know, this is what I was doing there. I'm not really the guy that whose ass you want to kick today. Oh, man. Was it uh, hopefully it was the offensive line because they're, you know, the the DBs <laughs> would have closed in on you pretty you know quickly. I, I was able to 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 get some space and, okay. and some sides. I think I'm thinking linemen. Yes. Well, let's see what how well did Tennessee do that year? Because we might have if they can't catch a neo-Nazi uh, impersonator or undercover, uh, you know, investigator, then no, they probably couldn't get it to the end zone. Sorry, Vols. Um, um, but uh, so I'd suggest to you, the cop, like, cause I would think even if a cop has no love for that, like the, the law, right, they should protect, that's their job, right, is to ensure order regardless of either side. I, yeah. When you tell that story, is the cop kind of breaking their civic duty there in your opinion well i mean there's a couple ways to look at it one way is that yes she has a she had a duty to to protect me but the other is like the cops are like you know there's these outsiders that come into our community and sort of like wreck things right and so um it caused trouble caused riots you know sort of at least spark riots and I think it's safe to say that 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 most of the counter demonstrators that were protesting against the white nationalists were from Tennessee, if not from that city. Whereas a lot of it, and this was the case in Charlottesville as well, a lot of the like racists, the ex racist extremists of all stripes were, were not from there. They were from all over the US, but they'd come to that one community to raise hell. And so she just, I think she kind of looked at me as like, look, Bo, you know, you, you made your bed, yeah. you know? <laughs> I'm not oh, going to let them beat you up in front of me, but at the same time, I'm going to have to get in my car and leave, and you're not coming with me. Just like, I hate Colorado Nazis, or Alaska, <laughs> Alaska Nazis. Right. Uh, man. So putting a bow on this, do you do you feel that, uh, and actually I'd love your just take in general because you've been in so many interesting situations, and I feel like you have a really unique perspective on this country, having seen the underbelly of so much of it. Where in the risk spectrum do you think towards the United States faces a lot of threats? Uh, I will say from a domestic standpoint, how big of a deal is neo-Nazism as far as a threat to the United States or just the average person? Do you feel it's a, a huge deal or because you mentioned, you know, you were startled at the organization and connections that yeah. they had. I mean, I'll say this, man. I used to get calls from um neo-nazis who would, who would call me up and threaten me and it would basically go something like this like look you jew loving race traitor uh the day is going to come the day of the rope is going to come uh <laughs> and on the day of the rope you know when all accounts are settled you're going to get yours and i used to find it hilarious you know i didn't take it seriously at all but on January 6th, when <laughs> there were people with neo-Nazi insignia on their jackets erecting gallows outside, you know, Congress, I reflected back on those calls. I was like, damn, like, I never thought it would get this bad. You know, even while I was, it, it, the truth is, man, when I was doing this undercover stuff, like, I, I'm not going to sit here and say I was purely ide ideologically driven and on some sort of righteous quest. The truth is, I like to go undercover and like get an adrenaline hit and like you know bust Nazis and, and <laughs> you know. But and but I never thought that it would that that their movement would become this popular and that their ideas, you know, there yeah. there there's people that would never think of like throwing a Sieg Heil or saying that Hitler was a genius, but who otherwise espouse a political and racial uh, agenda that is right in line with white nationalism and mm. uh yeah, it's pretty scary bro yeah man 
Well, thank you for your work and just the willingness to, to do all that. I'm, yeah, I'm curious, are there, uh, and you know, we don't have to get into politics here, but I, you know, generally as someone who's just seen so much of the country, do you have, are there, what things make you nervous, you know, and, and we should put a, a positive spin too, and things that you, you know, are comfortable or, you know, confident in this, but like, are there other threats that you've seen, um, or at the very least, do you think the UFO problem is going to be a big deal? Because <laughs> that's... Uh, that's another thing we can get into too is the uh, the uh, Pentagon releasing the UFOs. I feel like that has to be one of your next projects. I'd like to get into that. I've seen some I've seen some of those videos and they definitely give you a pause. Right? What are they? Know. What's that? Yeah, exactly. There's some there's some that like they'll go so far as like they'll be like, "Okay, will you acknowledge that they're mechanical in nature?" Yes. Will you acknowledge that they are moving in ways that seem to defy physics? Yes. Ergo, they are, and then they won't, they won't, they won't <laughs> say the word. You know? They yeah, won't so. say things like alien intelligence. So it has to be unexplained, unexplained aerial object or whatever the new term is. Yeah. No, You're on New Mexico, so you have to. I mean, it's it's part of the. <laughs> you know, it's it's sort of an obligation to do that. But no, but I guess back to my my meandering question: Is there, uh, you know, what's what do you think America needs to do right now? I mean, you've seen so much, but like what from David Holhouse perspective and what you've seen, like what does this country need? Question. I mean, well, first of all, the Democrats need a more uh, a better leader than Joe Biden right now, in my opinion. Someone who's willing to be uh, a bit more aggressive. But you know, see, the thing is, man, I come from Alaska, and Alaska, like political independence, really is um, the dominant, you know, politics. Like the, the 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 whole the whole partisan thing just really doesn't play up in Alaska. And so I didn't grow up in any sort of like partisan environment. And it's just like it's really like distressing to see how this is all you know playing out. I think especially being from Alaska, where people of different like opinions do and still I think to this day, despite it being the place where Sarah Palin came from, a lot of people then think like, oh, Alaska is like you know, like on that sort of like alt right you know, Trumpian Trumpanista tip, and that's not the case at all, man. And so no, I just trying to stay warm and you know watch out for moose, right? Yeah, and keep in mind it was the first state to legalize weed. Was oh, was it really? Way back in the seventies, yes, sir. Yeah. What is it? I was so you're you're from Anchorage, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is? I mean, I've I've never been to Alaska. It looks absolutely stunning. My main exposure to it was that Anthony Hopkins movie uh, where he fights the a bear, yeah. uh, but uh, I don't know how accurate a depiction that was. But it it, it strikes me as like well, I mean, just a unique place. One, you are the sun for half the year, the sun appears not to go down, you know, right. at some point, like that's gotta be strange. And then what do you do in the winter? I mean, do you, do you form the night's watch and, uh, you know, patrol the, <laughs> I'm like, how do you stay sane there in, in Anchorage? Yeah, it's tough. You gotta stay active. You know, some people just go just fully just hibernate and like retreat inside for four, four to six months. And then, but my approach was always to just like, you know, go skiing in the dark a lot cross country and downhill just like get outside and, and stay active with it i actually prefer the winters up there to the summers because wait you prefer does the doesn't the darkness like mess with you like your not circadian as the, not as much when i was a kid i love the summers because you just go totally manic and you just like you stop sleeping and it's like you know the whole thing with your parents where they like tell you to come in when it starts to get dark well it doesn't start to get dark <laughs> midnight or 1 a.m so you know we'd just be out ripping and running at all hours it was awesome but now as an adult when i'm up there in the summer it's just like this is too much man like somebody somebody turned the lights off for it's <laughs> crazy it just spins me out more than the, the more than the darkness does the darkness i find kind of like calming it's always a very productive place in time for me i was like mm. do make some good progress on creative projects whereas the summer it just feels like everybody's just boom just like scattered in a million directions i do have to ask you just because i've never been uh what is uh is there an Alaskan cuisine? Is there something that uh, Alaska's, you know, if we, we were talking about sopapillas in New Mexico yeah. and uh, Southern barbecue, what do we got in Alaska? Salmon, salmon, man. Barbecued salmon. That's, cool. that's, that's the thing. Yeah, Ooh. for sure. Maybe um, moose chili. Moose chili is a good classic Alaska. Ooh, moose dish. chili. All right, we'll have to find a moose chili sponsor. Um, well, as we kind of wrap up here, I'd love to ask, you know, for anyone who's interested in both journalism and or producing these sort of documentary films. Do you have any advice uh, for those who uh, are looking to be conscripted to embed themselves with uh, other existential threats to America? Yeah, be a multi-hyphenate, meaning like the more sort of like arrows you can have in your skill quiver, the better. Like learn to edit, learn to write, learn to shoot. 
maybe learn to operate a drone. Like the more sort of like things you can do as a one man or one woman band, the better, especially when you're first starting to, to, to get in. And then just like, you know, find that story. And my advice actually be anybody really looking to break in, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to tell you, Hey, max out your credit cards and finance the whole thing yourself. I would say like max out <laughs> your credit card and get a really good development reel and a pitch deck and then try and sell it to a production company. Um, rather than going directly to the buyers, I mean, rather than going directly to Netflix or Hulu, try and partner up with a production company that, that has belief in your story and your ability to tell it. And that's how you, that's, how, that's the best route to break in rather than financing the whole movie or series yourself is what I'm saying. And with your journey, you were fortunate that you had a buddy who was a director, right? Who had won it, or had you sold the concept to him as an idea and then they went out and pitched it? Um, it was Sasquatch. It was my friend, Josh. He like, we were working on a series together about the Lorena Bobbitt case and toward that we were about ready to finish it. And he was like, and he gotten to be a fan of this uh, show called Sasquatch Chronicles, this podcast. He was like, man, if we could just find a true crime story with some sort of Sasquatch angle or some sort of Sasquatch story with a true crime angle, like we could really make something special. And I immediately remembered this story that I'd heard uh, back in the early nineties up in Northern California on this dope farm about how these guys had been killed by a Sasquatch. And so, he was like, okay, look into it, see if there's any substance there at all. And it took a few months, but then we figured out that, yeah, there was. We started to find other people that had heard that story and started to be able to trace it back to a specific location and specific property owner whose property it was. And and that was enough to, to, to get Hulu to give us some runway money, at least, to, to keep digging. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, what's next? You know, I'm, um, I, there's, I mentioned that I was uh, sexually assaulted when I was a kid, and I wrote an, a S, pers, first person essay about that called Stalking the Boogeyman that um, was then adapted. But then I was adapted for This American Life, Ira Glass's jam, and then uh, became a play. And I'm, I'm actually in LA right now working with a friend on adapting that story as a screenplay, which is something that I've been kind of putting off and just kind of waiting for the right time to do. Um, other than that, I'm working on a couple of documentary projects that I can't tell you about because I've signed ironclad non-disclosure agreements. Love it. Um, yeah, but uh, it's that Renaissance Fair one, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> the Renaissance Fair. <laughs> yeah, and then you know, I mean, it's just the next. It's uh, since Sasquatch. The big question has been when, if, and when to do um, another show where I'm on camera. So I'm uh, as a, as a because in Sasquatch, I'm actually on the other side of the camera for the first and so far only time. Um, so it's just figuring out, there's been, just figuring out what the right next project is in that area as well, so. Awesome, very cool. Well, as we close out here, um, if you have one, great. If not, no worries, uh, we can edit this out. But uh, do you have, it is, you know, we are ostensibly supposed to be camping, but due to um, your, the commander in chief, as you mentioned, uh, treatment of gas prices right now we are unable to camp uh and our, our bus is quite cost prohibitive do you uh, uh do you have a sort of twilight zoney or other spooky story of something that's had to, uh, that's happened to you uh, we've had we always like to ask people just if there's something whether it's a ghost story or a ufo or a weird serendipitous encounter anything that makes you look to the skies and go man maybe we're in a simulation or something special is going on you know, the only thing that comes to mind is I have seen a UFO. I haven't seen a Sasquatch, but I have seen a UFO. And I think it may have been the biggest mass UFO sighting in history. It was the Phoenix Lights in the 90s. And I different people saw different things on that night. But what I saw was this. I saw a giant aircraft, that, like the size of like an Imperial Star Destroyer, but with no lights on it, but so big that it blocked out the stars and you could make the shape out of it. It was shaped as a gigantic oval moving at low altitude over Tempe, Arizona, uh, and completely silent. And, you know, thousands of people saw it. Some people saw that. Some people saw little lights that were moving in very strange ways that night. But when the government came out, like two days later, it was like, literally, it was a story that was at the level of like weather balloons or somewhere. It was, it was just like bullshit. You know, <laughs> what I saw was way too big. That's a big balloon. <laughs> what you're trying to explain this away is what, what is it? What was it? I don't know. But it definitely like, I, you know, I, my thing on Sasquatch is like, Hey, you know, I, I'm going to be agnostic until I see one. Okay. And the fact that I've spent a lot of time in the woods in Alaska, which is supposedly Sasquatch territory and Northern California and Oregon 
and I've never seen any sign of them, I kind of tend toward to doubt their existence. I don't feel the same way about UFOs. I don't know what that was. I would buy that it was a military aircraft, that it was supposed to have some sort of cloaking device that failed, but it was huge. I mean, it was like as big as a battleship. It did. It was so big, it didn't seem like it should be something that could be aloft. Was it sort of analogous to like the under like a Zeppelin, like a Goodyear blimp kind of thing, yeah, like that big, size? Bigger, bigger, much oh bigger. My, man, and you, that, that's, oh, that's so, did, was the Phoenix Lights covered in any of the recent, did you look what? up the recent? Oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But it was like, it got media coverage. You know, it was the classic thing of like, um, it was mocked. Like immediately people that claim that it was something other than what the government said it is were mocked. And that's like, that's been a PR strategy of the US government going back decades is just make fun of anybody that says that these things are, that these things could be should be seriously investigated. These things being UFOs or unexplained aerial phenomena or whatever they want to call it. But, you know, what I saw was, it was for sure a machine of some kind that was, you know, and, and then it was just gone, by the way. It was just, and you're fairly confident it didn't come from a bat. It came from a lab, what you saw in the sky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, had to throw something out there. Anyways, well, Dave, this was awesome. Thank you so much uh, for the time and just your work. This is, this is, I, you know, it's all in a day's work. I off to call my friends. Hey, good news, guys at Keto Chris. You sponsored the discussion on neo Nazism in America. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me do one quick plug of my own. I do have a website, David. Yes, Holcraft. of course. Um, Absolutely. Plug, yeah. plug, plug. Holcraft.com. Anybody that wants to read Stalking the Boogeyman or sort of like my self-selected greatest hits of Gondo journalism, that's, that's the place to go. We'll put everything in the notes uh, so people can follow up with you and uh, and read and go see, and also watch Sasquatch. Uh, it is chilling. And uh, if you're thinking about heading up to Mendocino, just, you know, it really makes me think differently about Mendocino Farms uh, when I go there. I'm just I'm, I'm <laughs> yeah. wondering what's what's really going on. So well, as we've been camping with David Holthouse, and if you see some member as if you too encounter an Imperial Star Destroyer in the sky, remember the TSA adage, see something, say something. This is Ryan Bethay and David Holthouse camping. Goodbye, campers. <laughs>